Hello, I'm Gary Downey. I welcome you to Engineering Cultures. Our purpose is to help you work as an engineer with people who define problems differently than you. The course travels around the world, examining how what counts as an engineer and engineering knowledge has varied over time and from place to place. It can help you become an international engineer, or as it is put in the United States, a global engineer. In effect, you will join us in traveling the world so that you can recognize and perhaps even come to value that you live and work in a world of diverse perspectives. In particular, you will gain some concrete strategies for understanding the cultural differences you will likely encounter on the job and for engaging in shared problem solving in the midst of those differences. Now, if you came to this class to learn about ancient engineering, say, how the pyramids were built, you're not going to get it here. What we do is follow the emergence and activities of people who became known as engineers. You will gain an understanding of how engineers have emerged over time and identified themselves differently in different parts of the world. You'll develop an appreciation for what engineers confronted by different cultures must face and be better able to analyze how your own perspective might relate to theirs. The first goal of this course is to help you understand how the dominant images of engineers and engineering vary around the world. Achieving this goal will help you function more effectively in an international engineering environment. Examining ethnic and national histories is important to understanding how engineers trained in different countries come to understand themselves, their problems, and their ambitions. It matters, for example, whether a given country was formerly a colony of England or of France. It matters how people assess social progress or advancement in society. This course adopts an archeological approach to history that is, following a method developed by the historian Michel Foucault, it digs back into the layers of history to examine the emergence of engineering identities that are important today. For example, if you explore the history of engineering in the United States, you will reach back to explore how engineers became invisible corporate employees in the 20th century, having previously enjoyed during the late 19th century the status of national heroes. Following the Civil War, civil engineers literally embodied the ideals of reconstruction and gained national status as heroes. Perhaps the most prominent were John and Washington Roebling. John Roebling, German by birth and a self-trained engineer, designed the Brooklyn Bridge, but died shortly after the project began. His son, Washington, trained as a civil engineer at Rensselaer, carried on the job which took 20 years. Also, according to David McCullough's book, The Great Bridge, there's good reason to believe that Roebling's wife, Emily, actually completed the project when he became ill for an extended period. Now, during this time, the Roebling men and civil engineers in general were seen as advancing the nation and society as a whole. Engineers trained in that period could logically have every expectation of national prominence. For mechanical, electrical, and later chemical engineers, this expectation of prominence was less true. First emerging from the machine shop and manufacturing shop, engineers in these fields located themselves inside of organizations, eventually becoming corporate employees who expected a lifetime of relative invisibility. The second goal is for you to understand that the concept of person varies from one cultural location to another. In the United States, the individual is the fundamental unit of society and philosophies that derive from individualism provide both challenges and expectations to all people. By contrast, in Asian context, contexts, for example, Japan, one's meaning as a person depends upon position within a household, 
whether the household consists of family members or corporate employees. People feel a challenge to fulfill obligations within the household. In other words, position comes first, and the theoretical individual who stands apart from all social bonds did not exist indigenously. Understanding such differences can prove enormously helpful in understanding people who have to reconcile challenges from more than one set of dominant cultural images. As you will see below, we make the case that we are all hybrids in the sense that we all face challenges from unique configurations of dominant images. The third goal is to develop insight into the political and economic activities of nation states, both within and between them. Mapping these activities can help you understand how engineers position themselves and are valued within specific countries. Is engineering a high or low status occupation? Is the practice of engineering directly or only marginally linked to national identity? What relationships exist among government, the private sector, and the institutions of engineering education? Also, what trends are dominant in political economy today? Since the end of the Cold War, residents of the United States have come to expect that the major purpose of institutions, and sometimes even individuals, is to contribute to the nation's economic competitiveness. Prior to 1980, though, at least since the end of the Korean War, the dominant image was that the world was divided into two parts, democratic capitalism and communism. Americans pictured the world as locked in a pitched battle between good and evil, and the big fear was that communism would continue to spread until it finally overtook democracy. When the Soviet Union began to fall apart in the 1980s, that image declined. Competitiveness rose up, followed shortly thereafter by the image of globalization. Now, at the outset of the 21st century, every nation has to grapple with the image of economic competition as a defining framework of international relations. It is often said in engineering that the first step toward a solution is to draw a boundary around the problem. Learning to draw these boundaries successfully is arguably one of the greatest strengths of engineering. But not everyone draws those boundaries in the same way, certainly not people originating in different parts of the world. Whether you are an engineering student or a working engineer, it is imperative that you learn to work with people who define both themselves and their problems differently than you. The final goal is for you as an engineer to become a critical observer of your own performance, a better critical observer, and a better an analyst of your responses to the challenges and expectations that confront you. We hope that learning to put yourself and your perspective into different contexts might help you to better identify and critically assess your own values. What are you trying to achieve through a career in engineering? How does the world look to you once you better understand your place in it and your perspective of it? Let's look at some objectives now. By completing units of engineering cultures, you should be able to analyze cultural differences as dominant images. This approach will enable you to analyze how people may both share a given culture and yet be different from one another. Such is especially important in a world where people are in constant flow, increasingly unconstrained by national boundaries. Thus, not only will you be able to describe cultural differences in ways that move beyond ethnocentricity, you will also develop your sense of perspective while realizing that the perspectives of people from other countries are not homogeneous. A second objective is for you to be able to analyze people's actions as efforts to respond to the challenges and expectations from different configurations of cultural images. People face different configurations of dominant images depending upon the circumstances of their lives. Engineers are challenged by dominant ideas of engineering knowledge, but like everyone else, they struggle as people with expectations from their ethnic identity, gender, class status, place of residence, and so on. 
We expect you to emerge from engineering cultures with a sharpened ability to analyze differences among people as the product of grappling with varying dominant images. Third, having completed units of this course, you'll be better able to make intelligent inferences about engineers and other people with whom you work, and to ask intelligent questions, both to further your own knowledge and to initiate relationships. I was walking on campus one day when I was approached by a young woman who had previously been in my class. She said, Gary, I wish I were taking your class this year. When I asked why, she said, well, I met this engineering student from Malaysia, and I couldn't remember what we had said about Malaysia. So I couldn't figure out the right questions to ask. I said, well, if you hadn't taken the course, would you have been curious about this person as Malaysian in the first place? She said, hmm, maybe not. Thanks, bye. And she was gone. Well, for me, this brief conversation was a great affirmation of the value of this course. She was able to take the crucial first step, the understanding that someone from another culture might have a perspective that was different from her own, but every bit as valuable. Fourth, you will master a new method of engineering problem solving, one of collective problem solving. The method is embedded in the words location, knowledge, and desire. You will be able to ask, how are these other people positioned in relationship to me? Location. What do they know? Knowledge. And what is it that they want? Desire. By exploring these questions systematically, you will be better able to map out the perspectives at stake in a given situation. You will also be better prepared to solve problems by accommodating yourself to other perspectives rather than necessarily convincing them or inducing them to accept that you have the better way. Fifth, engineering cultures can help you understand your own disposition toward the relative cultural visibility or invisibility presented to you by a career in engineering. Do you wonder how to rise above narrowly defined company interests? Do you measure your career primarily in terms of organizational contributions? Do the expectations you encounter as an engineer accommodate the expectations you have of yourself? While this course may not provide you with specific answers, it can help you focus more clearly on the questions. Sixth, perhaps the key objective of engineering cultures is to help you become a better leader by giving you the motivation to seek and the vision to attain leadership positions. Possibly the paramount characteristic of leadership is the willingness to listen. It means that one expects to be surrounded by different perspectives, is unafraid of them, and is prepared to accept them as potentially crucial components of workable solutions. Surely, cultivating an ability to listen is a fundamental block of leadership. Again, I welcome you to Engineering Cultures. I hope you will find the experience both interesting and enjoyable.